Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here. Thank you, Lord, because we know that you are powerful amongst us. Thank you, Lord, because we are not gathered unto you in vain. Thank you, Lord, because we will grow today. Thank you, Lord, because your power will be supplied to our lives. Thank you, Lord, because your spirit is supplied to our lives. Thank you, Lord, because your grace is supplied to our lives. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Hallelujah. First Timothy chapter 3. Again, First Timothy chapter 3, from verse 14 says, Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions, so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. Hallelujah. There is a way that is appropriate for us to behave ourselves in church. There is a way that is appropriate for believers to behave in church. And that's it is important for us to understand how to behave ourselves, ourselves with respect to the church because the church is God's gift to us, is, the, is, the, is God's gift to us by which we can, we can enjoy the true godliness. It is a place from which we can see the truth and live the truth. It's, it's, the, it's the entity that God left us with when he was taken up into glory by which we can uh, you know, live our lives as we ought to live it, that we may fulfill the purpose of God for our lives. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's important. We have to know how to behave ourselves in church. And you will not know how to behave yourselves, or you will not behave yourselves properly if you don't understand the purpose of the church. Praise God. You will not behave yourself properly if you don't understand the purpose of the church. Hallelujah. I miss you guys being in my front. I wish you guys been in my front. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's why they say you are preaching to the choir. To mean that you don't need to say it. Because the choir are usually people that are saved. You understand? No money. <laughs> All things being equal. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. If you don't know what the purpose of the church is, you will not know how to behave yourself. If they are telling you how to behave yourself in church or why you should behave yourself in church, you will not take things seriously. Hallelujah. Church all together. So I'm happy that everybody is following. So the church of God is given to sanctify us with his word. His word is the way that we can live our lives. It's the only thing that we can build our lives on. That our lives will be meaningful and can fulfill purpose. Um, the church is the place where we see the love of God, where we experience the love of God. The love of God is meant to be experienced in and through people. So it's in church that we can experience the love of God. Hallelujah. And so we saw the places that, you know, through which we can experience the love of God. And see, there's one path that is not... That of all the three things I told you, there's one that is not taken seriously enough. It is easy for, hum for human beings to understand that love is expressed by meeting your material needs. It's easy for people to understand that love is expressed by giving you comfort and mourning with you and being there for you. But many people don't usually understand that the love of God is also given by chastisements. Especially in the world that we're living in today. In this world where since, um, you know, um, Darwin and Karl Marx have cooked all the things they wanted to cook for, for humanity and their ideas have spread to all the corners of the earth and we're living in a world where people are self-centric. The new gods of humanity are no more, or they are still pagan gods but they have reinvented themselves and the way they have reinvented themselves is by the glorification of the self. There's the glorification of the self. Essentially people, and it's the last days like Apostle Paul predicted to Timothy. People have become lovers of themselves. People worship themselves. Everything is all about themselves. And this thing has even crept into the church. So that's why there are certain slants of teaching of the grace of God that makes the grace of God to sound like as if it's all about yourself. It's all about yourself. It's all about yourself. To the point where when we are teaching about judgment, and we're teaching about, teaching about chastisement, and we're teaching about judgment, it is interpreted only in the light of what is convenient for the self. 
People don't understand again. People reject any kind of idea of the teaching of God's conduct or God's behavior or God's will that results in something that is not convenient for the self. Did you hear what I just said now? That's why, you know, from years, from years ago, you hear people say things like, when the, when the Lord wants to chastise us, he chastises us with his word. He chastises us with his word. What the person is just telling you is that I cannot accept, I don't understand that God's chastisement of me can be something painful. Lord have mercy. The person does not understand how the chastisement of the Lord can be something painful. Why? Because it's about me. It's about how I feel. But the chastisement of our Lord is painful. That's why if you look at certain translations, you use scourging, scourge, scourge. You know what call scourge? That's where all those ideas come from. These ideas of Jesus was in the temple and he made a knot of seven heads. A whip of seven heads. But he wasn't really flogging people. He was only scaring people. There is a premeditation with which that a person has approached that this thing. What is it? It's about you and your feelings. Jesus will not hurt your feelings. Do you understand what I just said now? That's why people have struggled with reconciling Jesus on the earth with Jesus when he was resurrected and was talking to John. And people make excuses and do all kinds of negova that um, when he was resurrected, you should take revelation like a vision. As if it's not the Lord that was speaking. Have you read the messages to the churches before? Go and read it. Go and read it. No. It's not about you. Christianity is not postmodern. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about the Lord. And that which brings you into the image of God, that which helps you to grow, is good. That's why in Christianity, suffering is not necessarily evil in this world. Do you understand that? Ultimately, obviously, we know that in heaven, the Lord does not, that's not what God planned, planned for us. In paradise, there shouldn't be suffering. Do you understand that? Because, I mean, no father wants his child to suffer for suffering's sake. Do you understand that? <laughs> so the Lord did not create us to suffer for suffering's sake. However, in this world, because this world has been subjected to corruption because of our evil proclivities, the word proclivity then means what we are likely to do. Because of our evil proclivities, the kind of things that we like to do, the Lord has ordained that these things be allowed to shape us and help us grow. So the Lord does chastise. The Lord does allow things that are not comfortable in the time for us to grow. And even the church must also do that because the church is representing the Lord on the earth. Do you understand that? Listen to me, guys. If your church loves you, if your pastor loves you, he will chastise you when you are doing something wrong. This is not chastise with the word. He will deal with you. Do you know the difference between Judas Iscariot and Peter? Do you know the difference? Let me tell you the difference. The difference is that Jesus told one out in the name of Jesus. The other one, he said, do what you want to do. That's the difference. When one said rubbish, when one said something that was anti-salvation, <laughs> that was anti-God's plan, anti-God's purpose, he said this sincerely, but he was saying rubbish. He said, out, get it behind me, Satan! And he said, Peter, sit down. Oh. The other one said, the person that put his hand after me is the one. People did not understand because they were still eating. So everybody still put their hand after him. So he didn't know it was the person that put it immediately after me. So now I put his hand. I said, what you want to do? Four hundreds. If your pastor is telling you, do what you like, you are going to hell. I'm telling you. If someone loves you, you get to the point where your elders and your leaders are leaving you. Say this one. I feel it. Ah, Emma Fimileo. Please don't leave me. If I'm doing something bad, tell. Did you hear what I just said? Did you hear what I just said? I will try my best not to tell any of you, do what you want. But if something happens and I mistakenly tell you, do what you like. Just need that, start picking. Church, you understand the jokes I'm making, right? Uh -huh. Praise God. So listen to me. The church is meant to discipline you. Church is meant to discipline This whole idea, and you know, I remember those days ago when those, these ideas were popular. People struggled with 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 1 Timothy chapter 1, I believe, where Paul says that I've handed over someone to Satan. And they say, ah, no, it's not, it's not the love of God. <laughs> no, no, no. Chastisement is the love of God. 
what Paul was saying that we will excommunicate this person from the church and put the person in a place where the grace of God is not being supplied to the person. What will happen is that if you are not in the church, Satan can make a mess of you. So you will suffer in Satan's hand, but the person's spirit and soul will be saved. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Listen to me. Some things happened. Permit me to speak freely. You understand some of you that have the aptitude and the Lord helps you to go into that line to follow some of these things well, you will understand. Those of you who will not necessarily follow these things that deeply, just understand this. Something went wrong in Europe when something called the Enlightenment happened. There was a period when people began to think of something called the Scientific Revolution, when people began to think in, people began to create, people began to think of philosophy in a certain way that it should become experience-based, that we should test what we believe. We shouldn't believe things just because they said so. We should test it, we should observe, test before we make a conclusion and before we hold on to something. But the pro the, that was a very, very good thing for us. And the people that even started that movement were all Christians. They were all Christians. Isaac Newton, all of them, Kepler, them, all of them, Spinoza, they were actually all Christians, believed in the gospel. <clears throat> and the reason why they believed that thing was because they believed that God gave us a soul, God gave us a mind like him, by which we can look at what he has done and study it and appreciate it and give glory to God. Do you understand that? Almost all of them said that thing over and over by different ways. That God has given us our rationality so that we can look at the world and understand it and give glory to him. But as time began to go on, that idea of I can look at the world, understand it, make a conclusion, an hypothesis, believe it and test, that idea began to become idolized. They began to look at it like as if that is the only way to know truth. But if you understand what I just said now from the beginning, the only place that that idea works is for things you can see. Do you understand that? Do you understand? It's for things that you can see. But they began to idolize that idea that things that you can see, this is the way to know if those things are true or not. But over time, they began to idolize it to the point where they began to think, you, you understand everything I've been saying, Abby? Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Over time, they began to think that the only way to know what is true is by checking for things that you can see. Do you understand that? Over time, they began to think that the only way you can know what is true is by checking for things that you can see, but you know there's already a problem with that. Because there are many things that are, that you cannot what? See. That entire way of thinking assumes that your eyes are even working well. <laughs> Jealous that I just said that. In philosophy, what we say is that you have assumed that your cognition is working enough, the capacity to even see properly. It assumes that everything that exists are things that you can see, and it also assumes that even your eyes and your brain is working well. So that's why we now got to this point. So that idea, that evil spirit, flowed to the point where we got Darwinism. The idea that everything that was created started from two cells. But now, I'm not saying, I'm not against anybody that believes in evolution or anything and all that, but the point is this. The idea that it can happen without God because God cannot be seen physically. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I was saying? Hey. That's where the idea came from. Because you notice that some animals are different whether their body changes. Because of that, that must be the way that every animal came to be without any intervention that we cannot see. That's what we call philosophical materialism or reductionism or physicalism. Just the idea that everything that exists is things that we can what? See. And that's where the idea of what is postmodernism. That's where everything just came from. When Karl Marx came, that's where everything now became about physical things, what we can see. If we want things to become better because we've removed God, if people are being oppressed, the only way is for us to tear down the rich and make everything. Because that idea that God has been removed, that's where it came from. Listen to me. That feeling, that thing, that evil spirit, that everything is about what you can see, eh? it has crept slowly into our culture in the church. And so that's why that hype, it's not only hyper rational because hyper rationality is a good thing, right? That idea, this naturalistic ish idea that everything is about what you can see, it has affected our generation so much that even our nowadays theologians, when they look at the Bible, they, try, they want to interpret it in the sense of things that you can see. And then we begin to arrive at conclusions that are not the same conclusions that the early Christians arrived when they read it. So it's not be like as if we're having problems. That is the spirit behind people reading 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And they'll say it's too deep, I cannot teach you now. Because 
You don't understand what was happening. Let me tell you what was happening there. If you go and, and that's why if you read the any Christians before the evil spirit of the enlightenment came. The people understood, Christians understood that there is a dimension of the Christian life that is supernatural, that you cannot see. This is not a matter of um, you will test it and you will not test it. You can only, someone can only tell you that this thing has happened in my life. There's a, super, there's a part of it that you cannot see. So it's easy to say, um, when we preach the word, you grow thereby. And so for a person that a Christian born now that is naturalistic, they will say, that's why I can be, I can be watching church online. Hi, this is myself. I'm not going to complicated. That feeling is the reason why many people think that they can be watching church online. Because when someone is preaching, you can hear it, it is tangible. So Christianity is tangible. That's why they believe that, well, if I have a need, they can send money to me and all that. This part I want to talk to you about today is the intangible part. That's the spirit behind 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that there's an anointing. Different denominations say it in different ways, right? The Orthodox people, are, our Orthodox brethren will say it as the grace of God, supply of the grace of God, is a means of grace. You know, the early protesters, well, the other early protesters will say things like that. The, 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 um, the, the is a means of grace, is a way of supplying of the means of grace. We know in Pentecostalism and more charismatic people call it the power of God, the spirits, the anointing, all short, hallelujah. Listen to me, whatever word you want to use, let me tell you what I'm, what is happening here. There is something intangible that happens in the church when we are gathered together that is holding you up, that is working in your life and moving your life and making you a better person. You cannot quantify it physically and say, this was the word that I heard that made me grow. What you will just know is that when you look back after one year, you are not the same person that you were. If they are intangible parts of it. They are, they are called the grace of God that is supplied to a man's life that delivers him from the snare of the fowler that you cannot see. You know there's something called the snare of the fowler. Are you who just got saved yesterday? Ha. People that were saved from when they were children, you understand what they call the slayer of the fowler. Hallelujah. <laughs> the noise on pestilence. <laughs> that wasted as no day. We are a Christian. <laughs> you are coming to church. You are going every day. You are coming. You are going. You think it's by yourself. You think it's by your power. You don't know there's a grace of God that is holding you. That is the mentality from which Paul was telling him that send him away from church. Send Alexander from away from the church. Let's say thank you with him. Grace one, the church say. There's grace in the church. <laughs> there's the power of God in the church. He said, I've been coming to church for 10 years and 10 years, yes, I've not gotten a job. Listen to me. You are like someone. There's one very light, nice, after that, nice analogy. You are like someone. You're overcrowded in a room and there's only one AC. And there's heat. And you're sweating a little. And you say, this AC is not working. Why is this place so hot? Why is this place so hot? This AC is not working. Put off the AC. Put off the AC. There you will see heat. Romans chapter 8 tells us something. Apostle Paul tells us something in Romans chapter 8 from verse 26. It says that, See, God subjected this world to corruption on purpose so that this creation can hope in glory. That means that there is a, there is even a noise of pestilence in this world. There's a corruption in this world that the grace of God has been given to us through the body of Christ that carries us through so that we can overcome. There's some things that were very sure in the old, in, you know, for the early church that was very clear. Hi, may the Lord help us. People who and I was warning you guys that should not tell me that thing. So we enter my message. People who try to cut away from what the first Christians understood, it thing always causes problem for them. That's why the early church, and of course, some of those traditions calcified over the years to become meaningless. But if you want to check well, you will see the spirits behind those messages. The early church believed that if they excommunicated you, were no more saved. They will tell you that if they send you out of the church, you are not saved, you are going to hell. Do you know where that idea came from? It is not possible for a man to be a child of God and not be in church. How can you not be coming to church? The first sign that you have rejected the gospel is that you will not be in church. 
So if you do something that the church says this is not what Christian, they can you're not a Christian, that's where the idea was coming from. But over time, it's classified to mean if a, if a cardinal doesn't like you or a pope doesn't like you and he says, ah, that means you're going to hell. Do you understand that? That's where it later happened. But if you go and check early, what it means is that it is not possible for you to be a Christian and not be coming to church. Take this message as a rebuke. So people are going to listen to this message later. Some people are online. Listen to me. Take this message as a rebuke. You cannot be a Christian and not be going to church. If you see anybody that is in his house that says, I don't go to church, he is not a Christian. He is not. It's called the body of Christ. Have you ever seen a body that the hand is separate from the body? Have you seen it before? Then it's not part of the body. Do you understand that? Hey, hey, stop simple. It's that simple. That's why you see anybody that is not part of the church. Go and listen to them. You will hear rubbish. You will hear on Christian things. It is expected. You cannot be saved. Now, that's why you are saying what you are saying. They are the ones on Twitter and social media saying all kinds of rubbish. Ask them. It's the first sign. Just ask them. Which church do you go to? The church of God is a place where the means of the, is the means, is the church of God is the means of the grace of God. That means that it is a means by which God supplies the grace into our life. Call it unction, call it the spirit, call it the power. You should look at a couple of scriptures now. Call it the grace of God, whatever it is. Talking about that supernatural supply of vitality to a man's life. That gives him power, that gives him strength, that can do all kinds of things in a man's life. Hallelujah. And there are two ways by which the means of the, the grace of God is supplied into our lives through the church. Number one is through the people, through the saints like us. And the number two is through the sacraments. Hallelujah. Through the people, through our brothers and sisters in the church, the grace of God is supplied into our lives. Romans chapter 12. Through our people, through God's children, the grace of God is supplied into our lives. God has organized it such that the body of Christ is made up of different people, each one excelling in the gift of God. And that gift is given to that person for your sake. It's given to that person for your sake. So the person seated to your left and to your right, eh? that person seated to your left and to your right, that person is a means of grace to your life. There is a grace of God on that person's life that can be supplied to you, that can make your life better. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each one of you. He said, so he started by saying that the grace given me, you see now, verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though we are many, we form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. Hallelujah. So we belong to each other. He now says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Do you understand that? We have, di we have different gifts according to the words. One more church, are we together? We have different gifts according to the words given to what? Each of us. The grace of God is upon your life. I carry grace. Hallelujah. And you carry grace. Praise God. You carry grace. It has been given to each of us. And if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. There is grace and ability in each and every one of us. And it has been given for the sake of the body. Apostle Paul went hard in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's open 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He went hard on this matter. We'll read it through. We'll just start from verse 4. He went hard. The grace of God is upon your life. The grace of God has been given to each one of you. So that's why each and every one of you, you are a means of grace to us. You are a means of grace to us. You are important, and I'm not saying it now in that um, progressive sense of um, we need you in church, you're important to us, and all that. 
See, see, the, the grace of God is from the Spirit. Do you understand that? Uh -huh. So if you, if you want to cope, you go and God will give us the grace. All right. Uh -huh. but, but at the same time, I also mean that if you're a child of God and you are here, you are important because you carry the grace of God. Do you understand that? Yes. You understand what I just said now? Because it's the Spirit of God that is giving us. So you don't come and now say, yeah, I'm threatening us and terrorize us. We don't negotiate with terrorists. But at the same time, right, if you want to go, be going. The Holy Spirit is the source of the gifts, not you. At the same time, you, the, if you are here, the Lord wants to use you as a means of grace. The leader of the church, the overseer of the church, is not the means of grace for the church. Even the leader of the church needs people to supply to him also. That's something I've enjoyed in this church so much. Even the leader of the church needs people to supply to him also. My convictions are deepened every day because of my interactions with you. I learn from you. I hear things and they are deepening my convictions. Strengthening me. Making my, making the, my, the, my election unto salvation and my election of service making me more assured of it every day. Every day. So, you yourselves have been, a, have been a means of grace to me. Hallelujah. And you have been a means of grace to each other. And you know, smoothly in the rough edges. Where there's a little more to be done. The interacting with all of us and fellowshipping with all of us. Smoothing the rough edges. Makes you more fit. Makes you more... Do you understand that? Makes you better. Before... Before you came and before, you no, know, before now, before fellowshipping over time with the people, you could, have, you could have been in a place where you are just here to serve God. And you don't really they expect anything. You understand that, right? So, um, whether God can move in our midst, in, <laughs> let's just, you understand that? And then you'll be arguing on one side. I'm, I don't want to use names, all right? <laughs> And then you'll be on one side. You'll be arguing. Say, God, no, really, they move like that. We all speak pidgin now. And we're in the Nigerian church. So let's just go right there. So God, no, really, they move like that. You know, that kind of thing. And say, everything is okay. Everything is okay based on expresses and all that. And then, you now, because of that, you'll be dragging charismatic and Pentecostals. You understand that? And then, as you are dragging, and you're not taking advantage of some things, not noticing some things, not paying enough attention to some things, God will send you another brother that wears glasses. And then you'll be dragging each other. And guess what happens? The one that is on this side, that if we had left them, they will be saying everything that moves, that vibes. They will pull you. And then you, that you want to not be saved, they will now what? And over time, what will happen is that both of us are growing in the image of God. What are my excesses? What are my rough edges? Are being smoothed. What I don't take cognizance of, what is not important to me, now become important to me because somebody else is supplying there's providence in even the membership of a church. Do you know that? Do you know that God sends people to churches? Many of you don't realize, but me, I know. Many of you, God actually sends you here because if you were not here, it wouldn't be like this. So we don't take each other for granted because each and every one of us is a means of grace. We carry the grace of God. We are helping each other. You might not realize it, but we are helping each other. When you look back one year, you will discover how much all your brothers and sisters in Christ have contributed to you and made you a better person. Because each and every one of us is a, is a means of the grace of God. Hallelujah. Look at verse 4. 1 Corinthians 12 from verse 4. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. So it's the spirit. It's not you. Do you understand that? So that's why you cannot hold us to answer. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, different kind of mission, we serve each other. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. In all them, for all of them, but in all of them and in everyone. Do you see that? And in everyone. In everyone. Listen to me. Every one of you, God is at work in you. And there's a service. There's a ministry. There is a, um, you know, gift. There is a grace that you can supply. One of, the, one of the issues that we have as church is to try to systematize this chapter. And this is a historical issue. It's not only you. But systematizing this chapter is very difficult. 
That's why it's better. And this is my own stance that I'm pastoring you. I'm not going to systematize. I'll just say the grace of God is there. Because how do you want to quantify it? If I'm, if I'm speaking to you now, and I say something that I just thought I was saying something, I used an example, and I use it like a real example, and it actually happens to someone. And then I give a word that is meant to happen to somebody else. And the same meeting, I say a word that is encouraging the person. And everything. That's like five different things happen at the same time. And I'm what? Teaching. Which gift of the Spirit is that? But is it not the Holy Spirit? So, that desire to want to systematize and break it down to granular levels and say, you, you have the gift of teaching. You, you want to say, oh, that's it. The Spirit of God is at work in us. as what matters. Hallelujah. He now says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Your good is the church. When you don't come to church, there is a good that God has given by the manifestation of the Spirit that you are robbing yourself of. When you cut off yourself from the body of Christ, when you cut off yourself from your local church, there is a good that God has planned for you that you are cutting yourself off from. Do you understand that? Say, I carry grace. Say, I carry grace. For our good. No, you don't mean it. I want you to say it like an apostle. See, I carry grace. You don't know you are the saints one. Apostolos, you are the saints. Hallelujah. Say, I carry grace. Hallelujah. For the common good. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 8. To one, there is given the spirit of a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the same means of the spirit. We must not assume that Paul was trying to itemize it one by one. That one person can only have this one. Do you understand that? Uh, or that one, well, do you understand what I'm saying? Apostle, what Apostle Paul is con- communicating to us is that in each and every one of us, we will excel in the grace that God has given to us. Do you understand that? It's not deeper than that. Don't try to now try to dig down and say, okay, this one is not this one and separate from Mm-mm. Don't need to do that. The spirit of what he's trying to explain here is that the Lord, of, the Lord is at work in all of us in unique ways. Finish. That's all. Praise God. Verse 9. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healings by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing be- between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. <laughs> Hallelujah. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes to each one as he was determined. So it is his own. It's not you. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all in its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, I would not for that reason stop, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. Hallelujah. Let me read again. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. So the body, the body of Christ is not for some special people. It is for all of us. Because you, do, you, are, you don't see certain kinds of things excelling yourself does not make you less part of the church than the other person. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I now? What Paul is telling us here is this. Each and every one of you has as much stake in TEC as I do. Do you understand? I mean, we are coming from a background where church was about one man's organization, a social entrepreneur. An entrepreneur will come and put together factors of production to create a massive organization and release the spirit for it to grow. I get that. And so because of that, because that entrepreneur is the CEO of that body of Christ, <laughs> they look at it like as if it is his property and then he gives it to his children and to his children's children. All right? So we understand that. So you might, in your subconscious, when you are thinking of church, you think of one man as having more stake than the other. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Listen to me. Nobody has more stake in the body than another. Hallelujah. Verse 15. 
sorry, where did I stop? Verse 17 now, it says, if the whole body were an eye, would, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would the smell be? Where would, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed all the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. I love this verse 18 so much. He says, just as he wanted them to be, there is providence, there is the hand of God. Some of us met each other to do this by the power of God. This one, I even saw it. Ah, God, I don't know how, how much I should give all these details. Even me, I even saw it in the years before the setting up through my ministry from when I was in Ibadan up till now. The way God sent certain men into my lives. In fact, to the way God organized the house that I'm staying in. It was such a time that when I was even moving into the house, it was not even something that was so easy to afford then. But do you remember? We were so sure that this is, I would even need something. I don't want child. How many were we? But we just knew that this is what I thought. You guys know me now. You know the kind of pastor that you are, right? Born in the trenches, raised in the trenches, and okay with me. I don't even like big life. But the life of God was actually, God, I'm telling you, we decided to settle and stay in this place. The way God even organized it, the landlord, the way we paid everything, we got the I'm using this example for you to understand the power of God at work. It wasn't up to one month. The men of the ministry started arriving. I'm not even joking. It was like as if God set up that position that these boys are going to finish service. They are coming here because there's a work to be done. We don't understand some things. He said, just as he wanted them to be. Some of you are here. No one say some of you. Some of you don't feel more safe than others. See, you are here because God ordered your steps to be here. Someone invited you, and you think that just when invited you, God was at work, just as he wanted them to be, because there's something that God wants you to supply. So yes, you are important. Yes, you are actually important. You are. Hallelujah. Verse 19, if they were all one part, where would the body, what, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The people that we look at in church that they don't have levels. They are actually indispensable. Hallelujah. And the parts which we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lack it. Hallelujah. So the people that you even think are the ones that are in front and shining, they are not even the ones that we even need to protect the more. The ones that we are seeing that they are not shining, they are the ones that we even need to give much attention to. Because they are the unseen engines behind the ability of the church to move. Whenever you hear of any great minister, of any great pastor, they say the man has done so much work and the local church is doing something. Trust me. Trust me. There is no great work in this world that has ever existed in church. You will just hear the big names. But there is no great work that has ever been done because of the man in front. As, even as the church is small now, I contribute maybe less than 5% to the way the things are being set up. All the ideas, all the decisions, all the things that are being done, all the things that you see, is not the pastor that is deciding it. It's the men that God sends. And I mean that literally, not in a figurative sense. Many of the things that you see put together for us to be able to do certain things is not me. Hallelujah. Oh, verse 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Say, I'm a part of it. I'm a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets and teachers. Then miracles, then gifts of healings, of helping, of guidance, of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have the gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Hallelujah. And yet, I will show you a most excellent way. And then it goes into talking about the love of God, which is the bond that brings us together. Hallelujah. Praise God. So you're a part of the church. Everybody that you see in church is a means of grace to be a part of the church. If you check Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16, I need to move on now. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16, you see how that the Lord gave first up. When he left, you know, when he ascended, he gave gifts to men. And what are these gifts? Apostles, prophets, Evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You know, when you now go, no, let's just quickly open it. Let me just, there's a particular verse I want to focus on. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 
Look at verse 15 says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is in Christ. So we are all growing to become like the head. Now it says, From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So the church is growing because each part is doing its work. And we are growing into the stature of Christ because each part is doing his work. So that means when we're talking about you growing to Christ, to become like Christ, to become a better version of yourself, Christ is that, is that infinity picture. Christ is in the infinity picture of the goal that we're meant to be. That's why you never get to a point where you say, I've attained, I'm not like Christ. You will never, even when you get to heaven, you'll be going because Jesus is infinity. You'll be going forever and ever and you'll never reach it. <laughs> yeah, I just said that. But as you are growing and increasing daily from glory to glory, it is happening because each part, it's everybody's built, it, the body builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So we cannot grow if each part is not doing its work. When people are not doing what they should do, there will be deficiencies in the body. Church, are we together? Church, you know what I just said now? That's why each of us are lively stones. We are being built into the house of God. So where Christ can dwell. Vision chapter 2 verse 19. Check that out. Hallelujah. So people are a means of grace. You are a means of grace. I believe in you. As you believe in me, I expect that God will use you for me. And I expect that God will use me for you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Then we'll talk about the sacraments. The Lord ordained certain practices. The Lord ordained certain actions and certain ways and certain ceremonies and certain things that we do in the body of Christ through which he supplies grace into our lives. One of them is prayer. Prayer. I'm sure you guys know this one very well. James chapter 5. Proverbs 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That is grace. It makes power available. It makes grace available. Hallelujah. Praise God. Prayer is a means of grace. It's a sacrament. It is sacred to us. It's a sacred practice. That's, what, just, what, just, that's just what the word sacrament means. Hallelujah. It's not, it's, not, you know, it's not deeper than that. Praise God. The word sacrament just means that. It's a sacred practice. It's a consecrated practice. It's a practice that is holy, set apart. And through it, God supplies grace unto us. So when we pray, prayer is a sacrament. When we pray, we fellowship with God. And by fellowshipping with God, the grace of God is supplied unto us. One of the things that sacraments all do, and we're going to see them one by one, is that they open your awareness for God to have space in your awareness. It makes God big in your eyes. It makes God large in your hearts. This is what the sacraments were given to us for. They make God big. They make you aware of, what God, of who God is and what he has done. Listen to me. The awareness of who you are, the awareness of who God is, the awareness of what God has done, all those things, there are supernatural ways that those things are communicated to our hearts. Church, I get what I'm saying to you. It's not just by reading words that don't have meaning to you. Those words can come alive by a supply of grace. And that's what the sacraments do. That's why you can pray for revelation knowledge and the words that you were reading that didn't really touch you, that didn't really move your hearts. The grace of God will just enter that same word and those words will become alive in you and begin to affect the way you think, begin to affect your emotions. That's what the sacraments do. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, verse 18, Apostle Paul is speaking to the Philippians and he now says, we're talking about people that were preaching to put him in bondage and different motivations that people have for preaching. Verse 18 now says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of all the, of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I'll continue to rejoice. Verse 19 now says, For I know that through your prayer and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Again, another way for talking about the means and the supply of the grace of God. Do you understand that? He says, The Spirit of Jesus Christ. 
So there is a supply of the power of God that is called the Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit, but the supply of the Holy Spirit's life. Do you understand that? <laughs> Do you understand what I just said now? Do you understand what I just said now? So it's not as if you don't have the Holy Spirit before. He's talking about that supply of the power of God, that supply of the grace of God. He said, through the prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn for my deliverance. So God gives us these sacraments, these holy activities, these holy actions that we carry out, God gave them to us for him to supernaturally put himself in our mind. These are the intangible parts of where you are preaching the gospel to someone and you cannot understand why the person cannot see the way you are seeing it. That you, you are singing in him and him is making you cry. And you are rejoicing with another person who doesn't understand it. This thing. That's what will happen where you, for, something will happen in the meeting and all of a sudden a scripture just comes alive in your heart or for, for some reason you just finally realize that God loves you. This is what the sacraments do. The supernatural way, we cannot quantify it. I used to use the word cholera all the time. The same way you cannot describe color yellow to someone that is blind. Because it's not a physical thing. It's not a materialistic thing. It's not a physicalistic thing. It's an inner awareness and experience. The Holy Spirit does that in our souls and in our consciousness. So prayer is one of the ways that God makes himself big to us. That's why the more you pray, the more God is big in your eyes. And the less you pray, the more God looks small to you. The more you pray, the more you feel like a Christian. Do you understand that? <laughs> so prayer. Prayer is a means of grace. Prayer is a sacrament. And it is in church that we pray. It's in church that we gather together to pray. Of course, you can pray on your own. But we'll gather together as children of God to pray together. The grace of God is supplied through that. That's why we don't pray with prayer meetings. That's why we don't pray with our pre-service prayer meetings, our service prayer meetings, and whenever we're praying. Because prayer, during that period, God is supplying something into our lives. So I get what I'm saying to you. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Prayer is one of the sacraments. It's a means of grace. Another means of grace is the Lord's Supper. Our Orthodox brothers will call it the Eucharist. It is, the, it is a means by which the Lord expands his death, burial, and resurrection in our hearts. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's a way by which God infuses our consciousness with knowing that Jesus died for me. It's a way that the Lord will help you to remember. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. This is my body. This is my body. He said, The bread, this is, he was not speaking figuratively, he was not speaking in codes and visions and all that. He said, This bread is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when you don't take his body, you are robbing yourself of something that is for you. That's why you are behaving the way you are behaving. <laughs> he said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. I heard someone once said that it's only a dead person that you do remembrance for. If you're alive, you don't need remembrance. That's just... Very, very ridiculous. Beyond ridiculous. Verse 25, now says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant. So the body, the body, look how it says, it says, the bread is his body. He now says the cup is the new covenant. That means what Jesus accomplished, that shedding of blood. You see it in the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Half of your problems as a Christian is that you've forgotten what Jesus did for you. Half of your problem is that every day you are living your life, you are living your life without the consciousness of what Jesus did in your life. You act like as if Jesus did not die for you because in that moment you can't remember. He now says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, he says, whenever, every time you do it, and you actually do it worthily. You know, if you read the previous verses, not talking about not just doing it ceremoniously or just doing it anyhow, whenever you do it properly, 
He says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word proclaim there is, I think it's called the uh, katangelo. I think it's the word katangelo, which means to preach. It means to announce. So that's what it's actually saying. When you take the bread and the cup and you're doing it worthily, that means you are doing it with the same consciousness and mind, like as if you are gathered at the Lord's Supper with the Lord and the apostles. When you do it with that, um, yeah, with that consciousness, it's like as if you are preaching the gospel to yourself and to those around you. Just how that you said that. It's like preaching without opening your mouth. You are proclaiming what Jesus did. I want to ask you a question. If someone asks you and tells you that, you know this, this joke that we used to say that if you could go back in time, um, this um, hypothetical question is that if you go back in time, what would you do? If I ask you and I say hypothetically that if it was possible for you to go back to the Lord's Supper and sit down with the apostles and actually touch Jesus' physical body, what would you do? What would you do? If I could take you to a place where you would touch Jesus physically, not in your mind now, not intellectually, not rationally like a possessed person after the enlightenment. I'm talking about a Christian. That you could touch Jesus. What would you do? Would you not do like the woman the issue of blood? I will rub myself on his body. I say, Jesus, sir, permission to approach. Approach. I will hold him and rub my... The one that John Beloved did this morning. Ah, I will overdo I'll be following him around. Say, I want to use the toilet. I'll follow him. I want to sit down. I'll sit down next to him. I want to eat. I will do all kinds of crazy things. Crazy things. But guess what? When he left, he didn't go with his body. He gave us his body. That's a funny thing. He said, this is my body. This is my cup. So when we are taking the Lord's Supper and we look at that cup, we are touching it like as if this is his body. He is here with us. And we are, this is the body that was given for us. And we remember. So the same way that night he was telling them, I'm going to die, I'm going to resurrect. You remember that Jesus actually died. And he rose again. And he reappeared to those men that were on that table that night. So in a sense, we're not missing something that Apostle Peter did not. You see, if you have a sense of you're missing something, that Apostle Peter didn't know. You see, when Jesus was on earth, ah, the apostles enjoyed. Listen to me. That does not, that does not have to be your experience. Should I get up to you? Are you with me? If you go to chapter 10, go to chapter 10 from verse 14. He says, Therefore, my, brethren, my, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I see. He says, It's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ. Hey, Asha. He says, it says it's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation. The word participation there is fellowship, is the word koinonia. That's where it comes from. That's the word koinonia. It says that, that 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm in verse 16 now. 1 Corinthians 10, I'm in verse 16. He says that when we give thanks for the cup, when we take that cup, see, I, you know, every time I read the scriptures again, it seems to affect me differently. And my reverence gets one floor deeper. My reverence gets one floor deeper. He says, when we take this cup that I'm giving thanks for, he says, we are participating in the blood of Christ. You are fellowshipping with him. It's like you are there in the Lord's Supper. It's like you are there. Hallelujah. He says, we are fellowshipping with it. So God is big in your mind. If you do it well, if you do it rightly, if you take it worthily, if you do it as it should be done, with the reverence that the Lord expected us to re revere, the Lord commanded us to do it in remembrance of him. Oh, my God. He now says, and not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf. Because when we say that it is figurative, talking about the spiritual body of Christ. Oh God. Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all share the one. You, you understand now? The context is food offered to idols. So he's not talking about more spiritual eating. He's talking about physical eating. Hallelujah. Look at verse 8. He says, Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifice participate in the world? Do I mean that food sacrificed to idols is anything? Do you understand that it's food? So we eat and we drink. We fellowship with God. We proclaim his death. We are preaching to our souls that Jesus is alive. 
What you are telling yourself is Jesus actually died for my sins. He was buried and he rose again. The way the apostles ate with him, I am eating with him now. So that's why many of them that were doing it unworthily were falling sick. How will you not fall sick? How will you not fall sick? How will you not die anyhow? Hallelujah. Church, I was together. So the Lord gave the church the Lord's Supper as a means of grace. One last sacrament is the baptism. The baptism. And I don't mean what kind of spiritual baptism. All right? I'm talking about water baptism. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirit, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In, only, and in it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. So he now begins to tell us something very, very powerful here. He says that, see, there are some people that died in the days of Noah, and some people were saved. So they entered the flood with the ark, right? They went through the flood, and every other person died, but they came out of it. He now says, and this water symbolizes the baptism that now saves you. He said, this water symbolizes the baptism that now saves you. Also, not the removal of death from the body. So the water that you are being baptized with is not just washing your body. You are not just bathing. Hi. That's why when someone says that if you want to go and bath, go and bath. It's just what you're just putting water. It's, it's, it's very, it doesn't make sense. He says, not the removal from, you're not just bathing. He says, but it is the pledge of a clear conscience. Throughout God, it says it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know those words who says that if you want to go and bath, go and bath, that the person, the person doesn't know what he's saying. You're not just bathing, you're not just removing death from your body. It, is, it actually saves you, and this is what it means. You know, this is what it means. You know, when we, we read these people, with our post-enlightenment mindset and think that they're talking from our context where after watching Netflix, I have drunk, drunk enough of beer, you just go and read your Bible and say, ah, I'm, 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 re I'm reading the Bible. There was a context. There's a way these people think. And let me show you the way they think so you can understand. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you process your faith and are what? Saved. Do we agree that when you talk, when you confess what Jesus has done, you are saved by it? Isn't it? Do we agree that when you, that when you, say, say if you declare with your mouth, you will be saved? It is with your mouth that you profess and you are saved. So when you confess the faith of God, when you confess the gospel, the Bible says that that is what saves you. I want to ask you a question. If someone cannot talk, will the person be unsaved? If someone cannot talk, does that mean the person is not saved? Why? Hey, it's in the heart of me. Well, that begs the question. Why is this saying that your confession is what will save? Not just your heart. Why did he say that? You don't know. Let me tell you. That's why I'm your pastor. I'm a means of grace. The reason is because you cannot believe with your heart and you will not talk with your mouth. Do you understand that? That's why I use the word in verse 10. He says, it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So that's why the profession of your salvation through water baptism, that's why it saves you. Christians are baptized in water. Just like the Lord was baptized in water, Christians are baptized in water because it is a profession. It is a pledge of a clear conscience. That pledge of a clear conscience is irrevocable. You cannot disjoin it from a heart that has truly believed. It is, I have, you see, see part of the problem is that all of you were being saved by osmosis nowadays. Because I grew up in a Christian family, so I think I'm saved. That's what's happening. Why people don't understand. Let me tell you what this thing is coming from. 
Let me tell you where this thing is coming from. You are coming from a culture where you were a Jew. Your grandfather was a Pharisee. Your mother and father are Pharisees. Or well, you come from a culture where we, we worship Hercules and Zeus and Apollos. There's someone meets you one day and preaches the gospel to you and you now believe. Or God is not in my room. I will say, I believe now. We gather together. And just as he died, he will die in the water. And just as he was raised, you two are what? We strong the water. A pledge of a clear conscience that saves you. So the way you will confess with your mouth and are saved is the same way Peter is telling us that you are baptized with water. You are what? Yes, I'm saying, Jira. Jira, yes, Jira. When that happens, when a believer pledges that con their conscience to God, that's the reason why all this being saved by God people say, I just got saved and all that. I just got saved when I was in secondary school. I don't even know what it means. That confession, that repentance, that outward identification with Christ, that just as he died, me too, I mean, he's the firstborn from all the dead. Just as he died, I'm dying my own now. Because he died on your behalf. So just as he died, I'm dying. And just as he, because there's nobody that dies in water baptism, you understand that? Your pastor gets you out. In the same way, I'm raised. Hallelujah. It's because you don't know what water baptism is. If you do it, you can you can enter a state of pietism where you will see vision and you do it right. Because of the consciousness. That's why the Christians, they'll ask you, the original Christians are not the one after Azusa Shetra Revival. I'm just joking. Right? I'm just joking. Let me not, let me not, you know, that. Right? Praise God. Now, what I mean is this. When Christians, the reason why Christians took this thing seriously is that after you get saved, they will ask you, have you been baptized? Because coming into the faith is not something that you just do. That's one of the reasons why you look at the church today and you cannot tell the difference between those that were saved and those that are not saved. You don't sneak into Christianity. Do you know that? Hallelujah. It's a profession of your faith. It's a profession. And that's why in Matthew chapter 28... Matthew 28. Matthew 28. From verse 18. And Jesus said to them, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That and is not that is. It's not that is. You are making disciples when you preach to them, like just like we were told us on Wednesday. When you preach the gospel to someone, the person becomes a what? Disciple. You baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then you what? Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. They are not, it's not that is. And, and every time I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you, even always to the end of the age. Hallelujah. Praise God. All the means of grace can be taken for granted. Obviously. All the means of grace can be taken for granted. A man can take the means, all the means of grace that God has given us. A man can take God's children, God's people for granted. You can take prayer for granted. You can take the Lord's Supper for granted, obviously. You can take water baptism for granted. But that is not a comment on, you know, and because you took it for granted, you are still saved. That's not a comment on your salvation. It's a comment on your effectiveness. It's a comment on how much you will do for the Lord. It's a comment of the kind of experience you will have on the earth. Listen to me. A man can build gold, silver. A man can also build hay and wood. Do you hear what I just said now? Aha. A man can build gold and silver, but a man can also build what? He and wood. The work can be burned, but he himself will escape narrowly as a man that is saved. God has given us all these things in the church. God has given us all these things in the church. God has given us all these things in the church that the grace of God will be supplying to us. We are living in a corrupt and broken world. We are living in a world 
that is broken on purpose up until a time when everything will be perfected. In this world, you will have trash avails. In this world, you will have persecutions. In this world, causes of suffering will come. This is why the grace of God is important for us. This is why the grace of God is important for us. It is not when things are tough that you now leave church. It's like shitting yourself. It's like suffering twice. It's not the time when you are uncomfortable, things are not going well in work. That's the time that you now stop coming to church. That is even the time that you run to church. It's not because things are good and you're living the soft life and you feel like as if all your needs are met. And so because of that, you don't necessarily need church. Bro, that is the time that you need church so that you will not be lost and destroyed. The church is a pillar and the ground of truth. So everything about it, you take it with all seriousness. You take God's people with all seriousness. You take the means of grace with all seriousness. You take the word of God with all seriousness. You take fellowship in one another and showing love to one another, meeting each other's needs, comforting each other and all those things. You take it seriously. These are the reasons why the church has been given. And if you don't behave yourself appropriately, you will not maximize all it. The grace and the blessing that is inside of the church, you will not see it if you don't behave yourself appropriately. Any Struggle to me, but get to me. People will say stuff like, um, people will say all kinds of stuff, and they'll say that they've, they've been going to church for many years, and they don't see what church is doing for them. Because of that, they stop. The reason why it seems like church has not been doing anything for you is because you've not been doing anything for the church. How you behave yourself in church will determine the kind of grace and virtue that will flow to you from the church. People who give themselves to the body of Christ, people who honor it and take it seriously, they always receive the blessing of it. Church all together. So this is the pin on the ground of truth. Understand what the church is about and behave yourself accordingly. By the grace of God that God has given us, all the leaders of this church will do well to continue to remind you. Will do well to make sure that you constantly understand the reason why we are here. Hallelujah. The Lord will help us. By the grace of God given to us as a church, by the grace of God given to me as a pastor, I pray for you in the name of Jesus that the grace of God upon your life is awakened. Everyone upon whom grace has been given and it has been dormant and it has been quiet and they have not been given for the common good. Everyone who by reason of their gaze on the things of this world has had the grace of God upon their life, silent and quiet. I pray for you this morning that our Lord will awaken that grace inside of you. God will stir up the grace that he put on your inside. It will, he will stir it up like a fountain. Busting forth and overshadowing. It will flow and flow and spill and cover all your things. It will cover all the people around you. It will cover all your brethren. It will cover all your brothers and sisters. It will cover everyone that comes in contact with you. It will cover all the things that God has sent you to do on this earth. The grace of God is ministered to your life this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Hallelujah. Praise God.